Well, one of my most precious moments for when I was uh, working back in Central was one special time where Gordon Ramsay came to Peru to record one of his TV shows. But I remember that we had this very special moment opening one alpaca. So we were just taking all the pieces out of alpaca to, to record the show and cook with it. And I remember his excitement of the Peruvian products in general being there at 3,800 meters above sea level, looking at one chef that is so like recognizable and the reputation is so good, like being amazed by the products that we work every day, it makes you reconsider your, your situation, right? You're there working with amazing products in a very amazing landscape and we should be grateful for that. So that was one of my turn back moments in, in Peru saying like, wow, I'm doing something that is really, really amazing. Verticality in Peru is a way that we conceive life in general, like it's the way that we organize ourselves because it's a very drastic country, very extreme country in terms of altitudes. The menu that we're working now in Mass is called Vertical World. We are showcasing nine different ecosystems through our dishes. It doesn't mean that all the ingredients that we will use in the dish are coming exactly from that specific altitude but each of these ecosystem has an altitude attached to it. If we start below the sea level, we start going up and then probably going down again. So I think it's a very good, like, conductive uh, line for the people to keep track of this experience that sometimes could be a little bit extreme, right? The first dish of the, of the experience is called sea coral. We are at minus 10 meters under the sea. We are grabbing elements from the coral reef. We handle down this texture. This is a washi paper where we use a part of seaweeds as well, and it's kind of a light blue. These colors we also find using natural dyes to give this color to the washi. What is interesting is that we are mixing a Japanese culture of making craft paper in the experience as well. So this will be like the first contact that the customer will have with our ecosystems and also with this mixture of Japanese versus Peruvian culture. We're using the uni from Hokkaido on top of a crisp made from the sea lettuce. And also on the side we have a abalone that we cook gently and we place it in the front of a combo skewer. Hoya is this a seafood from Japan, very seasonal as well, that we recover with some frozen cantaloupe melon and some sea grape from Okinawa. So for our first element of the dish, we'll use the mussels. We're gonna blanch the mussels really, really quick, and we will cut it in these big chunks. To these mussels, we're gonna add tiger's milk sauce that we use for the ceviche. This is usually a very citric sauce. For this tiger's milk, we're gonna use a yellow chili pepper. That's why we have this very yellow color. Also with some uh, coriander, onion, uh, leeks, some celery as well in this sauce. Some chopped daikon to add some texture to our mussels. These are just in cubes. And after we dress this very well, the mussels are gonna go in the bottom of our bowl. To cover the mussels, we're gonna use a foam. It's a citric foam using some cream, lime, and a little bit of Parmesan cheese. We're gonna use a Michel Bra mandolin, just the standard blade, the flat blade. In this case, I will look for a very thin type of shaving so we can achieve almost like a kakigori type of texture with the frozen mussel terrine. All the cooked mussels stick together so we can make this terrine also using a little bit of the juices of the mussels so we can get like a transversal cut of all the layers. But as you can see, they're very thin and we can see all the different parts of the mussels. The idea is that when it gets into the table, the mussels are melting very, very softly, very slightly on top of our dish. In that way, we'll have like a very smooth texture of frozen mussels compared with the texture that is underneath with the chopped mussels as well. 
I will finish this dish using some sea grape from Okinawa, this seaweed that we will pop in the mouth. For our next component of the dish, we're gonna use these very small crabs. We first clean them really well and we fry them just to achieve this very crispy texture and we keep them in the dehydrator. We're gonna fill them with this emulsion or cream that we made with the meat of a different crab. In this case, we're using the Subai Gani. And we will also recover with some marigold leaves. The idea is that the marigold almost resembles the body of the crab that we obviously took out. Now we're gonna place it on top of these rocks. We call them picorocos back in South America. And we make this base using the wax of the bees and also some blue spirulina to recreate these cold rocks. For the next element of our dish, we're gonna use the barnacles. They look just like these ones. We're gonna take out the meat and we're gonna make also a broth with all the shells of the barnacles. So with the shells, we make this very nice crispy texture. When we fry it, we ensemble together so we can have this type of shape. We'll fill the barnacle crisp with an emulsion made from the iwanori, and then we'll recover with a powder made with the squid ink. On top, We'll place the meat of the barnacles that we just slice to get this type of very small circles. And to finish it, we're gonna add this plant. This is a wapara leaf. It's a coastal leaf that we find here in Japan. We'll just place it in between the barnacles. We shave a lot of different vegetables just to find these uh, exact cuts in most of our preparations. Also to achieve like different textures as well. The good thing about the Michel Bra mandolin is that first has a lot of different attachments to find different type of cuts and specific type of cuts that you cannot find with other regular mandolins. Also the shape and the durability of the products is much better than the other ones. It doesn't break as easy nice as shaving. some other mandolins. And also like the way that it's easy to, to sharp when you are working and sometimes it gets a little bit rusty. This one is very easy to detach and also to sharp the blade. So that's a lot of things that you will look in a mandolin and this one has them all. So it's very useful for mass at least. We are using specifically wines from Latin America. We have uh, some friends back in Argentina, in Chile, in Bolivia, and in Peru, making interesting wines with some concept behind it, using sometimes grapes from the altitudes or sometimes very close to the coast that uses uh, minerality from the sea breeze. For example, in our first dish, we usually use some wines from Chile done beside the coast. So you can feel sometimes the flavor of the coast in the wine, same as the dish. For the sea terrain, also a washy texture. The sea terrain means the vegetables that we can find in front of the coast and also some elements that we find in the sea. So this texture represents this duality between the sea and the coastal vegetables. So this dish has some botanevi, also some spirulina seaweed, and the jacon root. So we layer them in our dish. In the bottom, we'll find the botanevi with a citric sauce made from a chili pepper from Peru called rocoto. Then we recover with a spirulina foam. Underneath, you will find some thin layers made from the jacon and the kinjiso. The jacon coming from Peru and the kinjiso coming from Japan. We call it Amazonic pond or Amazon pond because we are using one specific ingredient that is very common to see in the Amazon, that is the turtle. In Japan, there's also a culture of eating turtle or supon. We are grabbing like these two similar elements that we have in our culture and put it together through our eyes. This texture in our imagination represents all the leaves that fall into the pond and they start getting like a little bit 
brown or decomposed by the water. This is for the people to see in advance where the turtle inhabits and how it relates with the vegetables around the, the pond. So what we're doing is a soup on stew that we place on top of a fritter that we make out of the sweet corn, the sweet corn here in Japan. And also we have in the bottom a sour cream that we made with the chincho herb. We try to choose always like the material that it fits better for the dish. Sometimes even the temperature, we put the, the spoons inside of a fridge so that they also have like this cold feeling of the metal when they're eating some cold seafood dish. These scales of the paiche, the paiche is an Amazonic fish, or we place a cutlery in this way for the people to start like thinking about what type of Amazonic fish we're talking about. Then we like to use this rock and we place some cutlery inside of the hole. This also gives a sense that something is hiding inside of a rock, like an octopus, for example. This type of uh, fabrics, this one we use for the Amazonic dishes, especially for the cacao. The type of fabrics represent the weaving of the Amazon and how a lot of different textures happen around these jungles. And even sometimes we use ingredients for example the diversity of corns that we're using this will be for example for an extreme altitude ecosystem where we have our corns back in the andes we're going to a 3800 meters ecosystem it's very high up in the andean range in this case it's more an image than a texture because we want them to really locate themselves in what type of ecosystem we're talking about now it's very high up in the mountains usually in peru here is where we have our cattle because it's where they have a space and grass that is very weird in japan no like they don't find this type of animals so high no but in peru it's completely normal the animals are already used to this type of uh, a little bit extreme environment and that's why we're using some uh, wayu beef from yamagata we dry age it first and we smoke it slightly we use it to recover a lot of different grains from the andes we have here the kiwicha the cañigua and the quinoa underneath a cream made from a herb called wakatai. We bring it from Peru. And in front, just to accompany this dish, we have uh, some potatoes. We have two different varieties of Japanese potatoes that we layer into a very crispy texture so people can enjoy the wagyu beef at the same time they're, they're eating the potatoes with the hand. So for each ecosystem, we try to represent as much as we can through the ceramics or the wood as well. That's why we have all these collaborations with different artists in Peru and some of them in Japan. For example, we have this very interesting mixture of two different types of clays from the Andes. That is a piece of uh, recovered wood from the Amazon. This is a palm tree that fell. We want just to use wood that fall into the, into the jungle, not something that we have to extract in this leather and the paicho fish from the Amazon is very flexible and gives this feeling of eating fish from the river. It's not that we're going from a very uh, low altitude to the Andes, but it's just very randomly different ecosystems. We can go back to the Amazon again and then go back to the Andes. Now we're going to another Amazonic ecosystem. We have here the fresh water. Junsai is this uh, Japanese type of plant that grows under the lakes, under some sweet water. And the texture is very slimy, same as some textures that we could find in the river in the Amazon. Also, we're using another river fish from Japan, very seasonal as well, is the ayu. We dehydrate the ayu, make it into a thin powder or flakes that we add in top of our dish, some white trout, in the bottom so we will put the junsai and the watermelon on top of the trout and we finish the dish using the flakes of the dehydrated ayu. Apart from our alcoholic pairing that we call mass pairing, we have our experience and sense pairing. A difference from other parts in the world, I will say that in Japan, the consumption of non-alcoholic pairings is much, much higher. So we really wanted to, to make some effort 
into these nine different beverages. This one is Karin or Quince juice infused with the Japanese pepper and also we have some fermented yuca root from the Amazon and it will give like a little sourness and a funky flavor to the juice. To finish it on the table we add some palo santo. Palo santo is this aromatic wood that we find in the Amazon as well and we smoke it in front of the of the guest so they can have uh, a little bit the smokiness of the Palo Santo into the drink. We just stir it up a little bit and we let it rest for a couple seconds and then we will get to serve it in front of the customer. And we return to the ocean where we have the ocean haze. We are at minus 15 meters below the sea level. We are very much inside of the ocean after some miles from the coast. We're using some ingredients from this part of the ocean. First, some cooked octopus underneath that we recover with a hollandaise that we made with the squid ink. And also we have some crisps on top made with the Iwanori seaweed. Also, we are gonna add a Japanese type of seaweed called Shiro Kirinsai. We serve it raw so people can feel the texture. It's almost like a cartilage texture mixed with the nice chewiness from the octopus. We're placing this loop of different sounds of the nature from Peru, curated by Maribel Taful, Peruvian a music engineer. We have this conversation with her in advance before we, we created mass as a concept telling her the type of ingredients that we will use, the type of ecosystems that we will use. With this information, she went looking for these sounds. It doesn't mean that each moment is in a specific ecosystem, but as you go in the experience, you will feel how the music accompanies the experience. So it's very interesting to see how sometimes you feel that you are more into the jungle or you are more into the coast or the music gets a little more vibrant or sometimes it gets a little more relaxing. Probably you will hear now in the video these sounds that we serve in the menu from beginning to start without any repetition. For our next ecosystem, we return to, to the Andes, where we have here the Andean forest. This is a space in between a very high altitude in the Andes and the Amazon. So we are 3,000 meters above the sea level. This is also something that we usually do. Take some ancient knowledge from the usually the Incas. It could be also Amazonian communities. But in this case, we're using an ancient knowledge from the Incas to explain this technique called watia. The watia is a technique to cook potatoes under the ground. What they do is that they first preheat these rocks using the fire. Then they take out the fire from this almost like pit and they put potatoes inside. It's almost a celebration to say thanks for the crops of the year or for the harvest. That's why they do it in the same spot where they're harvesting the potatoes. And we showed some of these pictures and some of this uh, knowledge to explain and sometimes make a little more visual what we are trying to put into the dish. And for this Andean forest, we're going to use also some sweetbreads, veal sweetbreads that we cook first at low temperature and then we charcoal grill it. And then we recover with a glaze of uh, panca chili pepper that we find also in this part of the, of the Andes. We recover everything with some uh, chuño crystals and also some mustard leaves. In the bottom, some mushrooms as well. So the idea is that you can eat the sweetbreads at the same time that you're eating the watia with the potatoes inside. Now we go to one of our first uh, sweet ecosystems. Our first dessert is called High Jungle, 18,000 meters over the sea level. We're using some lemongrass and also some lemon verbena into this also washi paper. This is another way of feeling the type of herbs and fruits that you will find in this ecosystem. Sometimes when we're using very exotic or, or different ingredients here at Mass, we like to, to give them the, the ingredient itself for people to see and touch. In this case, we're using the, the maca. The maca is a root 
from this part of the Andes, we make first kind of a crisp using the maca powder and we fill it with some burnt butter infused with the fresh maca as well. And then in the main dish, we will find some chirimoya mousse that we recover with muscat grape from Japan. And we recover with some kind of marshmallow strings made with the bee pollen to recover all the dish in the table. We're gonna do a sweet ecosystem. We're gonna use the jungle slopes. We find this ecosystem in between the Andes and the jungle. We have a lot of different fruits and nuts. That's why we're gonna use first the guava. We are bringing this guava from Peru. We make this very intense paste. Also, we'll use a seasonal fruit from Japan that is this black figs. So after we cut the figs, we're gonna mix them with some chopped lemon verbena. So we're gonna use a big quantity of lemon verbena. We really want the presence of the herb in our dish. We will add the paste of the guava, guava fruit into this uh, fix. The sweetness of the fix versus the acidity and the tanginess of the guava will make a very nice uh, combination. We're gonna use these uh, Brazilian nuts. We find them around the Amazon. We also call them like just chestnuts back in Peru. To make these shavings that I'm gonna do, the petit mandolin is the best tool just to achieve the same texture. The good thing is that we can adjust the thickness just by moving this part, this piece. So we're gonna put it in the thinnest because we really want some thin shavings of the Brazilian nut. And it's very, very, very easy to, to achieve this beautiful Brazilian nut scales. I like to call them scales. For another component of our dish, we're gonna make these strings. We make them using the guava and also a powder made from the hibiscus flower that we also find in this part of the Amazon. The way we do it is very simple. We just make like a marshmallow recipe using the guava flavor instead of using just regular sugar and spread it with a, with a piping bag into this hibiscus powder so we can achieve this very interesting, flexible, strings with the guava flavor. Also using our gingnam nuts or ginkgo nuts, we'll make this cream. It's almost like a pastry cream, but instead of using any starch, what we will do is use the gingnam nut as a thickening agent. We cook the gingnam paste with also some lemon verbena, that's why the color is also a little bit green. With the cooking process, we will get the thickness of the gingnam starch into the, into the mixture, so we can get this very uh, interesting paste of gingnam. We're gonna place the fix that we cut uh, earlier in the middle of the dish. I'll recover with the cream that we make with the gingnam. This will also serve as a attachment for our Brazilian nuts. And then I proceed to recover the dessert using the Brazilian nuts. To finish our dessert, we're gonna place the guava string surrounding our Brazilian uh, nuts, making a very irregular shape around them. And also, we will add some edges of the gingnam nut, very seasonal from the autumn here in Japan. And this way, the dessert will be ready. The thickness that it gives us at the moment of the shaving of the Brazilian nut is, is amazing and it's very consistent as well. You can graduate the levels of thickness that you want, so it's always the same cut, which is very convenient for us as well, at least in the pastry, in the pastry area. Well, always a menu has to have some kind of drink that accompany the experience as well and we really take it very seriously to showcase the full picture of what we're talking about. Mater Iniciativa, this organization that we have in Peru is like the research arm of all the restaurants that, are, that we have under the Mater philosophy. 
also create some very interesting products. For example, we have here uh, a cider with the apples that we find in the coastal area of Peru. This cider is a little bit sparkling. We use it for our first dish, for example. It's also from the coast. Need this uh, fermented honey. This honey is also coming from the north of Peru in Apurimac. But you can find this meat in one of our pairings in the desserts. Another very special, Otuber. Manuel Choque, producer of the oca, as we call it, that is the root of the oxalis uh, plant. He makes this fermented beverage using the juice of these oxalis roots. A little bit sour, but it's also a little bit sweet. That's why we use it very often with uh, or desserts or with some seafood as well. Last but not least, we have here the caque. It's also a personal project from Manuel Contreras, beverage director back in the restaurant in Mil, in Cusco. He recollects more than 40 different aromatics, roots, and medicinal plants that he then uh, macerates. It's more like a bitter than a, than a spirit. So you use it for our last dessert to make good alcoholic ending so the customer can finish drinking a very nice cocktail using this bitter. The last ecosystem, the ninth ecosystem, we're going to the Amazonia. No? We are at 7,050 meters above the sea level. This one is made by the mom of Virgilio, our director back in Central. She's an artist and she painted this ecosystem of the cacao in the Amazon. You can see more than just cacao, you can see all the flora and fauna on the surroundings of the cacao crops. So in our dish in the Amazonia, what we're grabbing is the family of the Theobromas. The Theobromas are the family of the cacao, which is composed by three main fruits, the copuazú, the macambo, and the cacao. So with these three fruits, we're gonna make six or sometimes seven different textures with different techniques. For example, we sometimes make a creme brulee made from the roasted macambo seeds. With the copuazú, we make a sorbet using the fresh pulp of the copuazú. Also, we serve the juice of the water of the cacao so people can really understand that the cacao is not just chocolate. The cacao is a fruit by itself, that it has some pulp, that it has a seed, that it has a shell, to give some sense to the customer that this uh, fruit is edible in so many ways that it's not just a chocolate. We usually change the textures pretty often so people can get like the diversity that you can do with this uh, cacao fruit and the copuazú and the macambo. She was one customer, she was Japanese, and this shows the sensibility that Japanese people have in general towards nature and towards this type of experiences. She saw some TV shows about Peru and she was very excited to go, but because of her age and condition, she couldn't go and take this long trip. So she decided to have a dinner here at Mass. And I remember that in tears, she was telling me that it was one of uh, like the best moments of her life, uh, saying that she felt like she traveled back to Peru and that she could fulfill this dream without leaving Tokyo, which is uh, very nice. And I think like doing this type of uh, moments in, in people's life, I think is what makes uh, our, our work very important and very meaningful. So that was one of my very important moments over here in, in Japan.